Hello, everyone. I'm Kenshin. Welcome to Talking History. Please take a moment to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Also, don't forget to turn on the notification bell. Thank you. Today's historical discussion is about the prototype of Ophelia the artist Elizabeth Eleanor Siddle. I believe even if you haven't read it, you're definitely familiar with Shakespeare's masterpiece, Hamlet. In this immortal work, Ophelia, with her unique feminine fragility, became an inspiration for many creations in 19th century British visual culture. For example, the pre-Raphaelite painter John Everett Millay painted a now famous piece titled, Ophelia, currently held at the Tate Britain. The scene depicted is of Ophelia, overwhelmed with grief after her father's murder by her lover Hamlet, picking flowers and eventually drowning in a stream. The lifeless gaze of Ophelia's eyes and her slightly parted lips seem to convey something. With a blank expression, she gazes towards the sky, filled with a heartbroken state of mind. Her hands rest weakly on the water's surface, the woven flower crown slipping from her grasp, indicating her serene detachment from worldly matters. Today, let's talk about the model for this Ophelia, who was no ordinary person. Elizabeth Eleanor Siddle, a talented female artist during the Victorian era of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, was also a poet and a model. Initially working in a hat shop near Leicester Square in central London, she made a surprising decision due to her mother's declining health. She became a model for artists, which was considered impudent and even synonymous with prostitution at the time. The first artist to hire her as a model was Dante Gabriel Rossetti, her later husband, who was working on a large oil painting depicting a scene from Twelfth Night. He then introduced her to the pre-Raphaelite painters, such as Holman Hunt, who painted The Awakening Conscience, making her the exclusive model for the movement. However, don't think of her as a delicate girl, her appearance didn't align with the aesthetic standards of the time. Today, her tall stature and lustrous copper hair would be considered symbols of beauty, but in the Victorian 1850s, sparse hair was deemed unattractive. At the time, red hair was even described by female journalists as social suicide, but her work as a model and her artistic achievements changed people's perceptions. During this time, the painting of Ophelia was in progress, and in 1852, as Millet's model for Ophelia, she floated in a tub filled with water, representing Ophelia's drowning. Millet painted daily in winter, placing an oil lamp under the tub to heat the water. Once, the lamp went out, causing the water to become icy cold. Millet, engrossed in his work, didn't notice the situation, and she didn't complain. However, this led to her contracting a severe cold or pneumonia, resulting in serious illness. Her father demanded Millet take responsibility, and under the threat of legal action, he paid all the doctor's bills. About the hidden meanings in this painting, there are several interpretations. The rue flowers, resembling columbines, symbolize ingratitude or folly, speaking to human betrayal and Ophelia's innocence. The daisy floating near Ophelia's right hand represents innocence. The pink roses floating near Ophelia's cheek and dress, as well as the white wild roses growing on the bank, symbolize youth, love, and beauty, as well as suffocation, death, and decay. The violet wreath around Ophelia's neck symbolizes loyalty, as well as purity and untimely death. The pale blue forget-me-nots by the river express Ophelia's hopes for Hamlet. The violets in Ophelia's dress symbolize thoughtfulness, as well as useless love. The bright red poppies with black seeds represent deep sleep and death. Additionally, on the left side of the painting, there's a lifelike yet easily overlooked kingfisher, praising Ophelia while lamenting her impending demise. Two years later, under Rossetti's tutelage, she began her career as an artist. Ruskin called her work genius upon seeing it. Initially, her paintings were often ridiculed by art critics, but with guidance from many experts and her own rapid progress, it became evident why Ruskin was so interested in her. In order to allow her to focus on painting, he gave her a yearly salary of £150, a stark contrast to her previous annual earnings of only £24 in the hat shop. Three years later, in 1857, at the London Pre-Raphaelite Exhibition, 
she was the only female exhibitor. One of her paintings, Clark Saunders, was bought by the influential American collector Charles Eliot Norton. To escape the control of Rossetti and Ruskin, she gave up her £150 salary and, using her meagre savings, left London to attend the Sheffield School of Art, determined to become an artist. In 1860, she fell seriously ill and moved to Hastings. Upon learning of her condition, Rossetti hastily brought their marriage certificate, marking a conclusion to their seven-year relationship. They spent a long honeymoon in Paris, during which she realized she was pregnant. Rossetti painted her contentedly, and she was happy about the prospect of becoming a mother. Sadly, on May 2, 1861, she gave birth to a stillborn child. Unable to recover from postpartum depression, their marriage endured a strain. Despite his friend's claims of Rossetti's fidelity, she still believed he was unfaithful again. On the night of February 10, 1862, after consuming a large quantity of lavender water, she passed away despite the efforts of four doctors to save her, and she succumbed in the early hours of the next morning. However, unbeknownst to many at the time, she was already pregnant again, perhaps unable to bear the ordeal of another stillbirth. As an artist, she mainly worked in watercolor, creating a series of small watercolor pieces in the mid-1850s. Like her lover and teacher Rossetti, she also wrote poetry and illustrated them herself. Unfortunately, Rossetti's influence was too great, preventing her from developing her own style in the end. Her works showed talent in composition and color, but her frail body and lack of technical training, combined with Rossetti's lack of seriousness as a teacher, resulted in her talent not being fully realized. Weak and feeble painting techniques are evident in her works, such as the inability to depict clothing and fabrics and the overly stiff and flat characteristics of the figures. However, there's a story after her death. In the autumn of 1869, her coffin was secretly removed from the London Highgate Cemetery and burned on the spot in a carefully orchestrated event by Rossetti's friend and agent Charles Augustus Howell. Why did this happen? Howell later told Rossetti, when the coffin was opened, Elizabeth's body was beautifully preserved. She was not a skeleton, but like a beautiful living person, her hair was long in the coffin and shone in the firelight. With Howell's embellishment, many people from around the world still believed Lizzie Siddle to be a spirit, even after her death. Decades after her death, a former classmate from the Sheffield School of Art wrote praises for her in a local newspaper. I knew her to some extent, but she left a lasting impression on me. This woman, whose presence can only be glimpsed through her paintings, made a significant impact on the perception of women during her time. The story of this legendary woman is worth delving into.